Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Eric Lethander. I'm the acting vice chancellor of the ANU. Uh, Wayne Ford. I'm the acting director of facilities and services. I'm John Norris. I'm the professor of astronomy at the ANU. I'm an associate director at uh, the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics, and I'm filling in for our new director, Matthew Collis, who uh, just landed in Pasadena a little while ago and is now getting on a plane to come back to uh, help us through this. Right, well, good afternoon and thanks for coming. I'd like to provide you with an update on the situation at Siding Springs. Um, Wayne will then be able to give you some more technical details about the damage and about the operations as they currently stand. And John will be able to give you a little bit of history about the observatory and the impact of this damage on the research that's carried out there. So consequent to an inspection of the site which was carried out this morning by the site manager of the Siding Springs Observatory together with the Rural Fire, Fire Service, the decision has been made to close uh, the Siding Springs Observatory for an initial two-week period to allow us to carry out a full assessment of the damage caused by the fire and to ensure that uh, the site is safe uh, for staff prior to their return. At this moment, the key priority for us is to ensure the safety and well-being of the staff and their families. As you may know, 18 people were evacuated from the site yesterday afternoon. Um, all those 18 people are safe and accounted for. And our priority very much at this stage is to ensure their safety. In terms of the damage at the site, uh, an initial assessment shows us that uh, at least five buildings have received significant damage, principally the lodge, which is used to accommodate visitors to the site. It can hold up to uh, 19 people in accommodation. Uh, but also the visitor center has been damaged. Uh, a number of residential cottages, which are used by staff who are based at the site on an ongoing basis, and a number of sheds as well. An initial visual assessment shows that there does not seem to be significant damage to the buildings which house the telescopes. We do not yet know what uh, impact the extreme heat and the ash might have on the telescopes themselves, and we won't be able to carry out that assessment until we can enter the buildings and we can inspect the inside of them. Uh, but we'll be doing that in the coming days if we're assured that it's safe to do so. This morning, a group of ANU staff traveled to the site. Uh, they're expected to arrive there this afternoon to provide additional support to the staff members who are already there, those who were evacuated. Uh, they'll assist with damage assessment, uh, with the cleanup, and with the restoration of services and administration. An additional team, including the vice chancellor of the ANU, Professor Ian Young, the director of the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics, uh, Professor Matthew Collis, uh, a staff counsellor, and other staff will be travelling to the site on Wednesday to provide additional support. So I'd like now to hand over to Wayne, who will be able to give you some more details uh, about the damage at the site. Thanks, Eric. Um, as Eric's identified, we um, have done an initial assessment this morning, and uh, a couple of things that we just wanted to identify back to you. The uh, site uh, no longer has uh, mains water supply, which is, actually comes from Coonabarabran. Uh, two of the pumping, uh, of the four pumping stations that uh, are along the main water feed to uh, the site uh, have actually been uh, affected by the fires, and there's been an initial assessment of those two that are currently not operating. Uh, but we do have over a million litres of water on the site uh, to, to assist with any further firefighting as it occurs. Uh, so water is going to be a problem for us if we can't get those uh, pumping stations up and running, but we've got very good uh, um, understanding of what we need to do to fix those up. As far as electricity, uh, there's no electricity to the site being supplied, uh, but we do have generators working there, diesel generators. So they're providing uh, essential power to uh, essential services up there, uh, but from time to time we will have to shut the power down uh, on the site to uh, to affect some uh, disconnection of those buildings that have been affected by by the fires. 
Um, our biggest issue there is actually keeping the diesel up to the generators so, uh, so we can continue uh, operating and continue putting power through to those essential services. Uh, as far as access to the site, uh, both Observatory Road, which comes off the main road coming from uh, Coonabarabran, uh, both are closed and both roads um, are only available for emergency services. Uh, we don't know at this point when those roads will be uh, able to be accessed, but we think it's highly unlikely that they uh, will be open, certainly within the coming days. We don't expect that at all, uh, because there's been a significant amount of trees, telegraph poles uh, that have come down. In fact, the team that went up there this morning uh, had to have a chainsaw and uh, take down quite a few trees to, uh, to gain access. Um, there, as of this morning, there was still three firefighting crews uh, on uh, the observatory site, uh, still putting out spot fires, and uh, um, essentially there's still quite a bit of burning going on of uh, tree trunks and so forth that have been damaged. Uh, we don't know at this point right now how many of those fire crews are still there. Um, following on from that, uh, there is um, uh, all the other essential services to the site. Um, we, we, as we mentioned, we don't, don't have any further people on site apart from those who are travelling up. We would like to get our um, researchers up there as quick as possible, as we said, to do an assessment of the telescopes. So until that actually occurs, uh, we can't really tell um, exactly whether the equipment is, is operating at 100%. The other thing that we'd like to do is clearly we want to make sure that it's safe uh, to go into those buildings. Uh, they may look alright from the outside, but we want to make sure that they're safe to, to enter. Um, and the ones that have been affected, severely damaged by fire, we also want to make sure that they're not going to have any further impact on the adjoining properties. Um, at that point, um, I'll pass over to, uh, to, to John to give you a bit of background. I'd just like to tell you a little bit about uh, the suite of telescopes we have at uh, Saudi Spring Observatory and our mission. Uh, in the early 1960s, the Australian National University established Siding Spring as its uh, major uh, field station, its major observatory. And I guess our mission since that time is to do basic uh, research at an international standard into the universe and everything in it uh, to train the next generation of students and also to outreach into the community to tell them about what we're finding out. Uh, initially we had a number of small telescopes of the one metre class but uh, I guess in the 1970s uh, the big addition was the uh, Anglo-Australian telescope, a 150 inch mirror optical telescope um, which uh, is there today and is the, the major uh, research instrument on site. Uh, as well as that in the years that followed we built uh, a two metre class telescope and after the fires of uh, 2003, just 10 years ago, uh, we established a new telescope there called SkyMapper, which is starting to produce results uh, about uh, uh, the universe as well. We also have something like six or seven uh, client uh, telescopes uh, on the mountain. We provide all the services that are necessary for them. And so you can see we've got a rather uh, big investment in what's up there. The other thing I'd like to tell you a little about, I guess, is the the sort of work that we've done and some of the, uh, the issues that uh, we've found fascinating and I think have made important contributions towards. We're interested, uh, obviously, in the way in which the university, universe, I beg your pardon, operates. It's probably no exaggeration to say that uh, the suite of telescopes at Siding Spring, Spring played a role in Brian Schmidt, our Nobel laureate, deciding to come to work in Australia. He spent a lot of time at Siding Spring. He's been watching what's been going on there with great interest. There's been a lot of major work done with the, the Anglo-Australian telescope, as you might imagine. There have been major surveys there which have also uh, told us a lot about the structure of the universe and the, its basic, uh, basic parameters. We've learned a lot about individual galaxies, not least our own Milky Way, and we've learned about, a lot about the stars that uh, uh, make up uh, the Milky Way. Uh, and finally, I would note that uh, exoplanets are a very important aspect of astronomy these days, and the AAO has major programs to discover uh, exoplanets, that is, planets around stars uh, some distance from us. Now, the other thing that I guess we do at Siding Spring is to uh, tune our ideas and to make hypotheses, guesses if you will, 
that we can take to the larger telescopes uh, overseas. Australia plays a role uh, in uh, the Gemini telescopes, two eight metre class telescopes, one in Hawaii, one in Chile, and we also have time uh, on the, uh, the 6.5 metre class telescopes, the Magellan telescopes in uh, Chile. And so uh, our astronomers, and it's not only ANU astronomers, it's Australian astronomers, use these telescopes. And in particular, I'd like to say uh, we use them for our students to uh, work on their theses and become the uh, astronomers of tomorrow. They're the main points I think that uh, um, I would uh, uh, like to, uh, to make. Uh, and uh, I guess at this point, uh, we might uh, throw the, uh, the meeting open for questions. I, I know you haven't been able to fully assess the damage there, but given what happened there yesterday, would you expect there to be significant damage to the telescopes and the buildings housing those, those, those equipment? I'll wait till I get, or someone gets inside the buildings. All I know is that uh, some of the information that have been coming out of the telescopes, that is, we've still been able to talk to the telescopes even though no one's there, is the temperatures in some of them was were not really destructive. The best information that we have is that uh, we've got a good chance that uh, uh, we'll still be able to continue work, but I emphasize we have to get in there to uh, make a, a strong statement about that. And if there is significant damage, um, what sort of setback is that to, to the work that you do and, uh, and the Australian industry here? We had a similar situation uh, 10 years ago at Mount Stromlo where we burnt down, okay? And so what we did was assess the damage that uh, we had sustained. And it was only when we had the information that we could form a plan as to how we'd overcome these problems. We have insurance, uh, I guess. Uh, at the, at the, on the previous occasion, the government helped us as well. And over a period of 10 years, we've uh, built, I think, back at Stromlo, um, things as good, if not better, than we had before. Uh, I'm not, uh, I mean, the big telescope on uh, Siding Spring is the AAT, and I'm not uh, a member of that, of that organisation, but I've worked with that telescope. I know the people there, and I expect they'll build, if they have the opportunity, something bigger and better. How, how, what is the value of the AAT? How much do these telescopes cost? I mean, uh, um, we, we can't give you any advice in relation to the AAO. Um, telescope, but we can certainly give you advice that um, uh, the, the value, valuations that we have for, for our facilities and also the equipment inside uh, is in excess of 80 million. Just on the human side, of, did the staff there, how dangerous was it for them yesterday? Did they get much warning to get out and did they get out in plenty of time? So I, we've known that there was a risk for a number of days. We've been in constant contact with the Rural Fire Service uh, and in constant contact with the staff there. Uh, the decision was made uh, around four o'clock yesterday afternoon to bring everybody down, uh, which we did. Uh, and so we're comfortable that they were not in danger. And as we know, thankfully, they're all safe and well. Is that a danger at the moment you know, and into the future? Is it gone or, or is there still a, a threat present? Uh, it's in a uh, right borders the National Park and it's also within, it's heavily forested around it. Uh, so it's always going to have the threat of bushfire. All we can do is try and minimise that as much as possible and a lot of effort has been made over the last uh, five years and particularly after the experience with Mount Stromlo to, uh, to improve our fire trails, to clear a lot of the, uh, the bush around the immediate proximity of the site. Um, but it's actually located on a mountain and fires like going up mountains. Um, so it's difficult then to, uh, to, uh, to do anything further than what we did and we think our preparation was, was excellent um, and uh, we think uh, there's, there's probably still some improvements and some things that we've learnt um, but uh, as far as preparation is concerned we think we've, we've done, oh, done pretty sure. well. John, as you mentioned, uh, almost 10 years today since you know, Stromlo and the 2003 fires, you uh, must have kept a beat and you heard that Siding Springs was also under threat. Absolutely, yeah. I was acting director in 2003 when it happened. Deja vu, yeah. Um, we've seen some pretty amazing footage from the cameras on site um, in a bit of a time lapse. Are you able to tell us how close the fire got to the, the, telescope, the main telescope or the telescopes on the ground? I guess I'd pass that over. Uh, again, we can only go by what you've seen and also the photos coming out of the Rural Fire Service. Um, 
we've been in constant contact with them, but they're, they're, they're always not there to give us exact details how, um, you know, how it affected it. But there is one particular video which actually shows it going right over the top of one of the telescopes. Um, and you can actually see in some of the maps um, exactly where the fire's gone and what it's missed and what it's taken out. Um, but apart from that, no, we're, we can only go back to the information and the photos that were generated whilst the Rural Fire Service were there. They've got some excellent photos that have actually given us a good indication of where, where it came, how it acted. Uh, but essentially, yes, it, it went over quite a few of the telescopes and kept going. Uh, now, as to say, this is fairly sensitive equipment we're dealing with here. What, what sort of damage uh, have, could these telescopes have sustained from, say, the ash and the embers, the smoke? I mean, well, how long will it take if these facilities have been damaged like that uh, to get them back online? Randy? Can I have a, a go at that one? I mean, we learned a lot from the 2003 fires. We know that a lot of the destruction at uh, Stromo was caused by embers getting in. And so, um, immediately after that, in a couple of years after that, the university undertook a program to use what it had learnt uh, at Mount Stromo at Siding Spring. And so uh, it cut a lot of trees down, it moved uh, rubbish away from buildings, and in particular it used uh, Primsafe, it was, to put protective things over awnings, uh, over windows. And so what we don't know, we'll get a report, is just where the embers got in. But uh, we're hopeful that we learned something in 2003 which we used in 2013. But I can't say until we get there. You say that you've been speaking, you can sort of talk to the telescopes. Is there, there any risk of any of your data or anything being lost from these fires? Um, I expect not, uh, because uh, what one does is to um, record one's data, okay, on some medium and takes it away, okay, um, and then uh, maybe actually send uh, stuff off the site electronically. Now, some of the AA. Uh, O's data uh, was recorded uh, and held rather in the, at least used to be held in the AAT itself um, but that would no doubt be okay so um, I would think that um, since no observing was going to happen over the weekend anyway that nothing of that nature will be lost and people who are wiser because of what has happened before um, will have taken their data with them. At Stromlo we, we, we have data uh, records, copies of our data on main campus, uh, which we hold for several years now. So we're not having uh, that problem. How are the affected staff coping at this stage, and do you expect they might need some extra help from the community? Um, yeah, uh, we, we had um, certainly quite a few people up there this morning trying to, and also remotely trying to contact all of our affected staff. Um, we couldn't get hold of some of them because quite a few of them have houses in the area and they're also affected by still the prevailing uh, bushfires that are in the area. And in fact, one of the staff members uh, was still taking the call as they were evacuating. Um, so we've, we've got to be reasonably careful to, one, provide assistance, but at the same time be understanding of the fact that there's still a fire threat there. Um, we, we think, we, we, we can't confirm it, but there might also be some of the staff members' houses are damaged severely by, by the bushfire, and, uh, and we're just trying to get confirmation of that. Um, again, this is on the road that leads down from the observatory. There's quite a few houses along that road to Coonabarabran and um, right now we're just trying to ascertain which houses were affected and who actually owns them and whether it was our staff members or not. And at this stage, do you think there'll be any need for any kind of appeal for help for those staff? Yes. Um, I think there is uh, uh, currently there's an appeal that uh, the university's um, setting up um, and uh, I think details of that will be coming out very shortly.